This program contains true stories of rescues. It's First Aid with Kelly Kincaid. Welcome to First Aid with Kelly Kincaid. I'm Kelly Kincaid, and today we're going to talk about a subject that amongst your friends, you're having certain conversations because a lot is going on in the world and we're living in a new normal. And one of the popular topics that we're talking about now is COVID-19. So I wanted to bring in my guest, who is one of the most prominent names in physician leaders today. He is the executive director of the American Public Health Association. Welcome, Dr. Georges Benjamin. Kelly, thank you very, very much for having me today. The first thing I wanted to find out from you, you are the executive director from the um, American Public Health Association. Now, I've heard, I, I, we always get a lot of our messaging from the CDC. What's the, what is your purpose and mission of American Public Health Association versus uh, the CDC? Is it the same? Are you all on the same, uh, like, vertical level, or what's your mission? Well, think of us. So we're a nonprofit. Um, we're a private sector organization. We're not government. We're a professional society of people interested in public health. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, um, we've been around since 1872. Wow. So we've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to try to just encourage people to be healthy. We do work with the federal government um, and members of Congress and the public to just try to promote health and well-being. Okay. Um as I, as I peruse through the, uh, your website, and I know it's a mouthful to say the whole, thing, uh, whole name of the organization, so I know you all use APHA. Um, That's so right. I, we use it as a noun. As a noun. <laughs> I, I, I love one of your quotes because we're talking about COVID-19. Many people have caught the virus. Many people have died from it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of questions. And I love what you said we all deserve an access to a culture of health, living as long as you can, as well as you can, and having a short but glorious ending. Now, this is what stuck out to me. It also means having a system in place that ensures we all can achieve it. The way the world is now with COVID-19, do you think, or, or how is the system in place uh, benefiting us right now as we see it? Well, things are not ideal. Um, obviously, the, the challenge we have with COVID is that, um, particularly in communities of color, we are disproportionately um, have diseases like heart disease, lung disease, chronic kidney disease that make us um, disproportionately more likely to get really sick if we get infected. And the other more important thing, I mean, in addition to that, is that um, while I can personally stay at home and have this wonderful conversation with you, far too many of my friends and neighbors got to go to work every day. So they out and about. And a disease in which you get from other people, they're much more likely to be exposed every day than I am at home, regardless of all of our health status. Right. And, you know, I, when we were talking before uh, we started this conversation, I was telling you a lot of people say, uh, my friends and colleagues, always are saying, I'm so ready for it to get back to normal. And I'm, I'm saying, we're not gonna get back to normal. With uh, the new way of living with our face mask, face shields, how normal or when will normal be for us? Well, look, you know, I think we have to recognize that every time something happens that's big like this in the world, it, it changes our outlook, okay? Whether it was World War I, World War II, Katrina, folks forget about how people's lives have changed after Katrina right. um, or COVID-19. So what we need to think about, I think, is that our lives are gonna be a little different. Um, it will take us a while because this disease is still rampant in the community, all over the globe. And while we were not a mask wearing society, you know, before, in fact, I gotta tell you, I used to, I used to laugh when I would see other people working, you know, when I go, travel around the world and I see people wearing masks. I say, like, why are they wearing masks? Right. Um, but we, we're probably going to be much more likely to wear masks in the future, much more likely to wash our hands, and much more likely to be a little cautious when uh, we're around other people until we get a vaccine 
until we get better control over this disease. And that's going to be about another year, to be honest with you. Let's talk about the vaccine. Vaccine. Um, uh, the vaccine is still being uh, put into place. Uh, a lot of minds want to find out, a lot of people are very hesitant to taking the vaccine. But um, I had a, had someone, Jay Valentine, who is from a California resident, he, he stated, I have a big family. And if I, if I should take, if I can take the vaccine to be close to my family because we're an affectionate family, we hug, we, we love to be with each other. Mm -hmm. Right now we can't do that. I'm willing to take this vaccine. Then you have other people who are like, I'm not taking the vaccine because it is scary. Where are we when it comes to this vaccine and the first batch of it? Like it, it is a lot of, it, it, where, where, what should we do about this? How safe is it? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about vaccines. So first of all, vaccine is just another kind of medicine. And I think we need to make sure everybody understands that. Um, and m many of us who have had to take medications, we take new medications that have undergone research studies all of the time. Right. And the vaccine is no different. Um, you know, those of us who have, um, who had kids who have taken that, that HPV vaccine for, um, the human papilloma virus, or who, who are older and have had to have the shingle vaccine. Um, we take new vaccines over time. So the fact that it's new shouldn't scare us. I think the important thing to know is that this vaccine is being studied. And like a lot of medications, in fact, most new medications have not had the, the public discussion like this one had, okay? okay. Um, it is, it, is, it, is not a, it is not a silver bullet. You know, it's, it's not going to, it will certainly help us. It will certainly dramatically reduce the spread of infection. Um, but at least initially, those of us who get to, who take the vaccine will still probably have to, you know, wear a mask for a while, wash our hands for a while, you know, watch where we go. Um, because um, until we get a lot more understanding of how protective it is, but it's important, I think, for, for our listeners to know that the most important thing to know is whether it's safe. And at least so far, it's, you know, this is all the studies now. Um, and the federal government has, you know, does regulation on this, hasn't blessed it yet. But the early studies show really good promise that'll, that'll be pretty safe. Now, you know, I love to talk to you later once it comes out. Because, okay. you know, I, I, I want to be frank with people. Um, um, I'm, you know, if all the, I'm going to look at the studies like everybody else, I'm going to talk to my doctor. I'm going to talk to my friends who are real smart and know this stuff better than I do. And then, um, once I'm comfortable, I do plan to get the vaccine. Okay. You know, I, before we talked, I was excited. Um, and I had, uh, I just told you one person, Jay Valentine had a question. So my mother, uh, who was 86 years old, uh, Dr. Ernestine Jackson, one of her questions pertaining to the vaccine was she's a CNN watcher, a news watcher, as far as the demographics, as far as testing it on the elderly. She wanted to ask, why are they starting there? And what affects, or, or, yeah, what's oh, the okay. reason for starting for the elderly first? And are, is, that, is that true? Well, they're not starting with the elderly. They're starting with adults. Okay. And we always start with adults. And there are two groups that we usually don't do research on right away. One, pregnant women and kids, but it's all Delta. And each of these studies, at least in the United States, is trying to get about 30,000 people in the big study. But let me just step back. First thing they do with these kind of studies is they do them in animals. So they've already done some early studies in animals and shown that at least it was safe and effective in the animals. And then they get a small number of people, usually 50, 60, and then they, they try it in those folks. Mm -hmm. And then if they do okay, then they go to a couple hundred. And then if they do okay, then they go to several thousand. So that's how they, you know, they, they do these vaccine studies, starting very small. And they, they capture anything, fever, short arm. Um, if, you, if you have a heart attack, just because you had a heart attack, 
and you happen to be in the study, they capture that too, because they want to make sure that your heart attack wasn't caused by the vaccine. Okay. So they look at everything they can, and then they go back and they do statistics and all that fancy stuff that they do to, to try to make sure it's safe. I think what scares people is we keep talking about how fast they're making this. So let, let me, if I could, let me just kind of cool. talk about this. So this is a vaccine for um, a coronavirus, all right? It, it's, it's, uh, um, it's called a coronavirus. That's the family of viruses it's in. And folks will remember we had the, the SARS virus several years ago? Correct. This is in the same family as that virus. So the truth is they've actually been trying to make a vaccine against the SARS virus for several years. So it's not like they just started working on this kind of research for this kind of you know, virus in January. They've been trying to work on it for several years and had learned a lot so that when this virus hit, they were able to jumpstart the process. They had already done a lot of animal studies. They had done some early studies in people. And you remember that, that, that little virus? Everybody has seen the little picture of that little virus, that little blue thing? Yes, it's yes. It's like Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> with the little spiky things. Yes. Well, they knew that the spiky things is what made your body react. So all they had to do was start with the spiky things. And generally, trying to figure out what part of the virus makes your body react can take many, many years. So they were able to really cut that part off because they knew that already. And then they um, have learned a lot of new things about vaccines in the last 20 years to help cancer. Um, you know, we've been working on, on, on virus, on vaccines for a whole bunch of other diseases, other infectious diseases. Um, and so they use that knowledge to kind of accelerate the process. And then the most important thing was viruses actually, I mean, vaccines don't actually make drug companies a lot of money. They make money, don't get me wrong. But they don't, it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't a blockbuster like um, the little blue pill <laughs> or <laughs> something for, for your nerves. It doesn't make that kind of money. But the federal government guaranteed to buy it so the companies weren't taking that development risk. And so they were able to not only, when they're, when they're creating the vaccine for research, they're also putting some away um, and they're going to rapidly be able to produce it once they know it's safe and effective. Follow me? So they yeah. were able to, to sequence it in a way to cut off years of development from that process. So as I retain everything that you're saying, it is a little overwhelming. And I think that I, one of the questions I want to ask, why is, why, is the, why has it been so much confusion with this? Because Immediately when I talk about, if you're saying it was it started with the SARS and it was years in between that, now we have COVID-19. So why, what was going on when COVID-17, 16, 15 was happening? Was uh, so, well, is, COVID, is, that, is that such a thing? COVID-19 is just the year that it was discovered. Okay. There, was, okay. there wasn't one in between. But, but what happened? The money ran out. See, this is what happens with our investment in science. We, we throw money at stuff, and then we get tired. The, the, the people that give us the money stop funding things. And so people take their projects and kind of shelve them. Um, that, that's one thing that happens. So the money kind of ran out for that really robust research. Um, and uh, that was unfortunate. That's a mistake. So a lot of us are really trying to encourage the government to put more money in the research at a higher level and make a longer commitment, much more strategically, so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. But by the way, this happens all of the time. I want to talk about trust, trusting the uh, public health uh, uh, officials, people like you. When I talk to you, I feel I feel safe. You sound comforting, but there's other people when we talk about the pharmaceutical companies and that it is a money maker and people of color for pushing people of color for vaccines. Um, how, how, how can we trust them? Because you saying, I'm going to take the vaccine, but then when we look on the news, it's not trusting. And, you know, 19, 2019, 2020 has been, I think the distrust amongst people has grown higher. How can we live longer and trust the public health to say, okay, we're going to take 
this vaccine. Yeah, our, 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 um, our officials have done a terrible job at communicating with a uniform voice. And so let me tell you what I tell, you know, I haven't practiced medicine for a while. I've been a paper pusher for, you know, for several years now. Right. But let me tell you what I, what, I, what I would tell folks, you know, when I was taking care of patients. I was the ER doc. That meant, I, you know, I had to go in and convince you that I was, you know, you should do my advice in five, ten minutes, right, when I saw you in the ER. And what I would tell folks was, look, here's, here's, here's what my best advice is and here's why. So I try to be real transparent and real clear about that. And let me, and I also said, look, here's where you can get a second, second um, uh, opinion from. Mm -hmm. You know, trust me, but verify what I say. And nowadays with Dr. Google, <laughs> yeah. um, if you go to a trusted source, you know, and not a lot, there's some trusted sources and some not so trusted. You can check what out what I say. Um, in the old days, when I went to medical school, you know, we had these, these, these very thick textbooks and we had all the secret knowledge all to ourselves and we kept that, you know, all that stuff and we would tell you stuff and people couldn't get that information easily. Right. Different world we're in now. You can verify what I say. Um, I think I think one of the challenges we have is social media gives a lot of misinformation. Uh, you know, Auntie Sue and Uncle Joe, people get their information from them. They get their information from their grandmother. That's okay. Right. That's all right. But but they need to verify it and just don't run off and do things. And if it sounds like it doesn't make sense it probably doesn't make sense. Right. You know, all, most of us have common sense. So if it doesn't make sense, you know, check it out first. Right. Speaking of um, the upcoming, we're in fall, the, the winter, winter is coming. And reports are, uh, report, it's being reported that COVID-19 rates are gonna continue going up. How can we prevent that in amongst, we're approaching, in, in addition to winter, holiday travel is approaching. Yeah. How can we Listen. prevent uh, the numbers? I don't want to be a number and I want to see my family. It, it, it's very, it's a conflict of what should people do traveling uh, during this holiday and in the winter. Yeah, let's be honest. You know, um, life is not um, risk-free. Um, and so I, t I talk to people about this, about reducing their risk. Okay, and so there's several things one can do about reducing your risk um, from COVID. One of the first things that one can do is um, recognize that we're also in cold and flu season. So I encourage people to get their flu shot. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, if I was seeing you, if I was still in the ER or your doctor's office seeing you, and you come in with fever, chills, muscle aches, and cough, maybe a little shortness of breath, okay? Those are the exact same symptoms whether you have influenza or COVID. If you've had your flu shot, it helps me with my differential diagnosis that I need to look at something else other than the flu. I'll probably still check you for the flu, but I'm much more concerned that you have something else, you know, if you've already had your flu shot. I'm gonna dig a little deeper, first thing. Second thing is um, there is some evidence, early evidence now, that getting your flu shot kind of jumpstart your immune process that might help you with COVID if you were get, to get exposed to it, okay? Not 100%, early studies, haven't gone through all that peer review, but it's interesting, interesting, okay? Um, and you know, a lot of us are out there doing all kinds of stuff, quote unquote, jumpstart our immune systems. Yes. Um, some of it works, some of it doesn't, you know? Um, I, think, I think, but honestly, this is real clear. The most important thing that all of us can do, of course, is, is good hand washing. Um, and um, this mask, this mask is wonderful. It is very effective. Wear your mask. Um, um, and, and, you know, when you're around other people, this mask turns out, I know we told people not to wear a mask earlier, we were wrong. This mask is very, very effective because the way I infect you and you infect me is the stuff that comes out of my nose and mouth, mm. right? If I keep six feet apart, most of that stuff that comes out of my nose and mouth falls to the floor. Not all of it. Yeah, I can cough around the mask, but just common sense tells you that if I got this mask on, I'm less likely to put stuff in your face. And all of us have, you know, been, of course, you know, talking to folks and having them spit in our face, right? All right. We know that's true. 
Second thing is, the, well, the third thing, you know, washing your hands. Third thing is keeping that distance as much as you can. And you asked about travel. So can you travel? Sure. Understand that you just have to make it as risk-free as you can. Okay. So driving someplace um, is safer than, you know, being in any of the public um, conveyances. But if you got to travel, you know, wearing that mask, you know, cleaning your hands and stuff after you've touched surfaces. Um, and, um, and by the way, don't go anywhere as if you're sick, right? Don't go to your family's house if you're sick. Don't go around grandma if you're sick. Um, and have a plan. And I think that's the, you know, that will reduce your risk. Mm -hmm. And th that, that's, all you, that's all I can advise people to do. Now, I, I, I know if I could make all of us, you know, stay at home, and wave a magic wand, I do that. But I would look absolutely silly giving you advice that, that you're not gonna follow. Right. So what I try to do is say, follow this best advice, stay home if you can, but if you gotta travel, here's how you do so safely. And that's how I usually talk to patients. Okay. Um, I wanted to get um, into, with COVID-19, uh, Helen Smith of Detroit, Michigan, asked about uh, the after effects of COVID-19. Uh, first thing is, why are the numbers in African Americans higher? And what are the after effects? Is it different with African Americans and other races? And why? That's a, that's a wonderful question. So first of all, of all people, 80% of the people that get infected seem to not have a lot of symptoms, don't get real sick. Um, but somewhere between that 15 to 20% of people get real sick. You're much more likely to get real sick if you have high blood pressure, um, you're overweight, you have diabetes, you have chronic lung disease, uh, if you're a smoker, you know, if you're vaping, um, you're much more likely because you cause inflammation in your lungs and you're much more likely to allow that, allows that virus in, okay? Um, that's probably the simplest way to think about that. Um, and it just turns out that folks of color are much more likely to have those chronic diseases. Right. Second thing is I mentioned ex early exposure. The fact that we're out and about in you know, public transportation jobs, bus drivers, running a train, sanitation workers, working hotels, um, working nursing home workers, right? Um, so we're much more likely to be out and about in a quote unquote essential jobs. And so the, therefore you might much more likely get infected. Um, there is, a, there is a, a couple things that people ought to know. Kids don't get as sick as, we, as, as the adults, but when they do get sick, they get really sick. And so kids can get sick. Any of us can get sick. And the other thing we know is that there is some chronic diseases that go along with this. In other words, COVID itself, there's, there's people that reported that they've been fatigued for a long time. They've had um, just real problems, continued shortness of breath, continued cough. You know, the first lady still has a cough from COVID, right? You remember that was a few weeks ago that she, she had her, her case. So we have people that certainly have that. Now, I think it's too early to know we don't really know whether or not African Americans have more of these chronic problems than others yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remind folks, the disease, we've been dealing with this disease yeah, maybe nine and a half, 10 months. So we'll know more um, probably, you know, over the next year. Uh, but just know that there is a syndrome, a chronic syndrome, whether or not we disproportionately have that chronic syndrome than you know, non-Hispanic whites, we do know that we're much more likely to get real sick if we have those chronic diseases and we get infected. Mm. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, and I want to talk about the kids, um, educators, and parents uh, who are going through it. <laughs> you know, kids yeah. at home, uh, but certain states and cities uh, have their children back in school. Some school systems are about to move to uh, the hybrid uh, model. Uh, Jamie Jackson Matthews of Las Vegas, or Henderson, Nevada, she's an educator. 
and she has a question because in addition to her being an educator she has a, a two-year-old and a six-year-old and she's concerned about her kids one going to daycare and one going to back to school how can parents be, com be comforted that uh, they're okay and what procedures or precautions should they do when they're not with them and going to daycare and school? Again, we have to make sure everyone's clear that um, the only way to be zero, you know, be totally risk-free is stay home. Mm -hmm. with, with, that, with that understanding, then um, there are ways to go to school safer. And um, again, wearing a mask, hand hygiene, and people are trying to make the class sizes smaller. So, so a bunch of reasons for that. You can handle the kids better. You can give them better, you know, instruction, and they're not crowded together. Um, the some of you know the schools have kind of still have a debate between whether they'll be you know six feet apart or three feet apart. And interestingly enough, um, there's been just a, a whole range of experiences um, where there's there's um, you know. With, with some of these kids. And, you know, I gotta tell you the best um, measure of whether or not it's safe to try to open up your school is what the disease prevalence is in the community. So we, we, um, we do the testing and the amount of testing that we think show, you know, the amount of positive tests, if you do enough of them that we think that shows that you're doing enough testing is under 5%. And while we had some communities that did reach that number, you know, we're having a massive return and big outbreak in the country. And so most of, or many communities, I won't say most, many communities have positive rates of 15, 10%, you know, some 20, 30% still, um, because particularly some of the rural communities where this thing is going rampant in the Midwest, et cetera. Um, so I think that, you know, as you see, a lot of schools have kind of started, they opened, and then, then they're reclosing because they've had a few cases. Right. And the answer is that, you know, now I have grandkids, so I'm thinking about this just like, like she is. Yeah. And uh, the, the challenge we have is, um, by the way, Maryland is, uh, I'm in Maryland, and Maryland's uh, rates are going back up again. So... I'm encouraging people to stay in a kind of, at the very best, a hybrid environment, but depends on the prevalence of disease in your community. And I thought I would follow the advice of the public health authorities in the community. Um, and if you have concerns, then um, you, you have to work with the school to make sure your kids are getting the education. Here's, here's the other side of that. Um, we don't want kids to miss the education they're going to get. So in our communities, you generally communities of color and some low income communities, those kids don't have access to Wi-Fi or computers or the ability to do their classes effectively. And so what the schools are trying to do is trying to balance the risk of getting infected and the risk of, you know, losing out on that education. Because once a child has lost those, those months of education, it's 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 difficult to get back, right? Um, let me let me say one more thing. Uh, I think that the it, it does require a really thoughtful discussion with your school, your school teacher, teachers, and um, the concern that I have is not that the, you know like I said most kids do okay. You know, even if they get infected, they do. Most kids do okay. But grandma and sometimes the parents have chronic diseases. And so if the kids get infected, they're going to bring those diseases home to their parents right. or their teachers or, or their teachers. So if you're a teacher, you know, the school needs to have procedures in place to protect the teachers as well. Um, the maintenance workers at the school, um, anybody with chronic diseases. And so it does require a plan. And if the school has a plan, um, then, then parents ought to look at that plan and make sure they're comfortable with it. Does that help? 
it's, it's so much information to retain. Uh, I guess my follow-up question with the rise of cases of COVID rising, what's your thoughts on when, it, when we first got locked down and people, we were going out for essentials, um, and, and this is something that I follow, when I would get in the house, take everything off, shower, um, you know, get rid of that, uh, get rid of what I had on, because it might be contaminated or it might be COVID on your clothes or what on yeah, your yeah. stuff. Should we be following that procedure still? I don't think we need to do all that stuff. Uh, uh -huh. A couple of things we learned about the virus. The virus dies pretty easily. Okay. Uh, and that's why you generally don't have to worry about your mail. Um, um, there are reasons to wipe down your food, but it, you know, um, but it's not necessarily COVID. Um, so if, if I am infected and I cough on my hand and I grab a, a can of soup and you come right behind me and you grab that can of soup, yes, you might get infected. Okay. But the likelihood of that happening is very low. And even though in, in, in the laboratory, the virus can live around for hours, in the real world, it just doesn't seem to do that. There's not a lot of evidence that we're having big outbreaks from, from people touching stuff. Now you can, right? Again, I cough in my hand, I touch the doorknob, you come behind me, you touch the doorknob, and then you self-contaminate yourself. Yeah, you can get it. But, the, the, you know, the, the washing the clothes when you get home and all that because you went out shopping and that kind of thing, yeah, I, I, I'd recommend you don't have to do that. Now, what's the exception? Um, people who work in medical facilities where you're around COVID patients, you should follow the infection control procedures of the institution in which you work, um, and you should um, follow their advice. You may remember in New York and some of the other big cities, um, some of the folks were so concerned about bringing the disease home to their family members that they, they didn't come home. They stayed away for a while while they were, they were on duty taking care of patients right. with the disease. And every institution, I think, you know, has some protocols and you should follow that. The other place you can look is the CDC's website. It gives pretty good advice. Um, we should trust the CDC on this advice. I've looked okay. at it, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. They give pretty good advice on, on how to handle this and how families should handle that kind of stuff. Um, and I encourage people to use, the CDC's a trusted source on that. As a physician, so you're what I'm uh, gathering. Just you're saying protecting this is most important: the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, That's ears, not, in your body. not ears. You haven't had any cases of people getting COVID. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I don't think that's the way to get it. No, no, and um, and you know um, it, it, the right now there's no evidence you get it from a toilet seat. Okay. Um, there's no evidence that you get it, um, uh, at least certainly not easily. Mm -hmm. right? um, can you? Sure. And we know that viruses, you know, we do pass viruses in our stool, but we don't, it doesn't seem to be something you get from food. It doesn't seem at this point to be something you can get from the blood, so from a blood transfusion. So, so far, we've not discovered that that's the case. Um, and we've not seen big outbreaks because, you know, people went to a public toilet. Now, you know, I still encourage people when you go out like that to wipe things down. And again, the safest thing is wash your hands afterwards. Get the hand sanitizer, clean your hands as frequently as you can. Um, you know, those, those kinds of things we know reduce the risk of a whole range of germs, including COVID. Um, I, I wanted to end with when we talk about public health, we, we have to talk about our mental health you know, because we're, we're unable to, a lot of people are, a lot of people, you see it all across the country. You're seeing certain cities like Atlanta uh, and other places that are starting to have parties again. They're, they're not social distancing. Uh, younger people are, are contracting COVID-19. Dr. Benjamin, what can we tell these people who even young, old, uh, who are missing that that mental that that physical interaction? Uh, it's an emotional thing. What can we tell them? Because it's been we've been doing this since March. You know, we're, we're headed to the end of the year, and they want to party. They want to get out and they want to do this. How can we 
how, what's the balance here? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I just, that takes me back to college and medical school. Yeah, I partied hard, real hard. I, I know partying, right? I miss it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me say two things. Let, let, me, let me just first talk about this whole issue of um, the emotional well-being of people. So first of all, we tell people to be physically separate um, and distant, but not to be socially disconnected, mm -hmm. right? So that means certainly, you know, FaceTiming folks, Zoom meetings, making phone calls, um, talking to your family members, talking to your friends. Uh, there are many things that one can do to remain connected, first thing. Secondly, recognize that um, depression and mental, you know, um, um, and sadness, um, we need to elevate mental health to the same level as our physical health. And we need to make sure that if you have a family member that is overly blue or overly sad, that you reach out and get them some help. And if you are feeling that way yourself, please tell your family members and get some help. There are professionals that can help you with that, okay? Yeah. Um, and this kind of event, just because we're disconnected and terrible stuff in the news and, you know, the fighting over the vaccine and what's right and what isn't, people are really upset, right? And afraid. And I was, by the way, I, I say that there is a, actually a, an epidemic of fear as well. So we should acknowledge it. We should deal straight on with it, not hide it, and help our, help our family members and our, and our colleagues and loved ones with that. Um, on the issue of partying, so I love it when folks, you ask me about taking your clothes off and washing them and doing all that kind of stuff, and they do that, but don't think nothing about going out to a party to have a good time, right? Right. The party is, the, you know, the more people in the room, the greater risk of in that room of somebody having the disease. And, you know, alcohol and party and lots of people and COVID is a bad combination, right? <laughs> Common sense. And, and folks just need to recognize that I know we all want to get together. Look, Thanksgiving's coming. Christmas is coming. We just went through Halloween. And I just tell folks, plan your holidays. Realize we're going to be doing this a little differently this year than we did it last year. And if we do that and get our hands on, around this virus, then next year we can have a bigger party. But we got to get our hands around this virus and everybody got to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. That is, it's, it's a lot of information. Um, and I thank you for clarifying some things for uh, the people that ask the question, I want to thank Jay Valentine, Helen Smith, Dr. Ernestine Jackson, and Jamie Jackson Matthews for their questions. And I want to thank you for your time uh, as the executive director of APHA. Uh, any final words uh, to give people who are, who, who are coping, who uh, have been COVID-free or who have had COVID and they just want to get past this? Yeah, look, I'm going to tell them what I would tell anybody if, if I was still practicing clinical medicine. Listen to what I say, hopefully pass my advice, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, but verify what I say. Verify what everybody says. Um, if you do that, you'll be stronger for it. Um, the American Public Health Association website is APHA.org. The CDC's website is CDC.gov. Um, and if you're an international person, you wanna hear what the folks at the World Health Organization think, is who.int, int, it's the international. So Google us, verify what we're saying, and then, you know, my advice is to follow that advice and just do stuff that makes sense. Thank you so much. And Dr. Benjamin, we have to have you back when we get more information on the vaccine, because I know it'll be more questions, and I would love for you to come back and give some more insight on that. I, I would love to be, I'd be honored to do it. Okay. Kelly, this is wonderful. I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy talking to you too. I'm Kelly Kincaid, and this is First Day with Kelly Kincaid. See you next time.